It's well known which integers are the sum of two rational squares. And from that description of which integers are the sum of two rational squares, it's easy to see that such integers have density zero. And moreover, it's true for the sum of two rational squares, the case of squares, an, int an integer is the sum of two rational squares if and only if uh, it's the sum of two integer squares. And, and that occurs precisely when there's no local obstruction. So the case of the sum of two rational squares is very well understood. Uh, a number is the sum of two rational squares if and only if it's the sum of two integer squares. And that occurs precisely when there's no local obstruction. And that gives you an explicit description of which integers are the sum of two rational squares, uh, namely those whose prime factorization has all primes that are three mod four occurring to an even power. And such integers have density zero. And so that's the full story for the sum of two rational squares. In contrast, the integers that are the sum of two rational cubes uh, don't seem to follow any simple pattern. So here are the first several integers that are the sum of two rational cubes uh, up to 35. Uh, there are a lot of them, uh, but they don't seem to follow any simple pattern. It doesn't seem like there's any simple description uh, of these integers. And in particular, it hasn't been known whether the set has strictly positive density in the integers, positive natural density, or density strictly less than one. Say if we took the limb inf of the of the density, is that positive? And if we took the limb soup of the density, uh, is that strictly less than one? Uh, so even that has not been known, whether the set of integers has positive density or density strictly less than one. And in contrast to the situation for squares, it is actually possible for an integer to be the sum of two rational cubes, but not the sum of two integer cubes. Uh, the smallest example being six. So six you can easily see is not the sum of two integer cubes, but it is the sum of two rational cubes, namely six is 17 over 21 cubed plus 37 over 21 cubed. And so that's an example of a number that's the sum of two rational cubes, but not the sum of two integer cubes. And as you get already up to say 35, and you try to write it as a sum of two rational cubes, uh, the denominators start to get very, very big. So it's often not very easy uh, to even find how to represent a number as a sum of two rational cubes when it is one. And one more thing to note is that there's never any local obstruction for an integer to be the sum of two rational cubes. So you can't rule out a number uh, from being a sum of two rational cubes just by, by local obstructions. And so proving results on the density of the set of numbers that are the sum of two rational cubes must require global arguments. Okay, so that's, uh, so that's the problem, understanding the set of integers that are the sum of two rational cubes and understanding whether they have positive density and whether they have density less than one. Uh, that's the problem I want to talk about. And the theorem, so the main result, uh, is that when integers are ordered by their absolute values, or you can just go across the positive integers because if uh, the positive integer is the sum of two rational cubes, then so is its negative. Uh, but when ordered by their absolute values, a positive proportion of integers are the sum of two rational cubes and a positive proportion are not. Uh, that's the result, the main result that we prove. So in other words, the density of the set of integers that are the sum of two rational cubes is strictly positive and strictly less than one. So the density is strictly between zero and one. So more precisely, uh, what we prove is that if you take the limb inf of the density of the integers that are the sum of two rational cubes, that limb inf is at least one twelfth. Okay, so that's what we mean when we say the density is strictly positive. And similarly, if we take the limb inf of the density of the set of integers that are not the sum of two rational cubes, that's uh, strictly greater than one sixth. So that's what we mean when we say uh, the set of integers that are the sum of two rational cubes has density strictly between zero and one. So a positive portion that can't be expressed as the sum of two rational cubes and a positive portion that can be so expressed. Okay. 
Okay, so I hope the statement is clear. Any questions about the statement? Hope that, hope that's clear. Yeah, so this is, this is the main result. Oh, so right. Yeah. Sorry, was there a question? So, sorry, we have to uh, take the mic around. Uh, so, I was curious if you have uh, a guess if the limit actually exists at all. Like, you know, the limit, of the, if you take the other limit for the limit. Uh, yeah, we don't know whether the limit exists. Yes, yeah. so we're only proving something about the limb and the limb soup of that density. Okay, so no, no, not even an important guess. Right? Yeah. So uh, the guess would be, yeah, the guess would be that the, I mean, we're proving that it's strictly between zero and one, but the guess would be that it's uh, exactly one half, uh, that exactly half of all numbers should be the sum of two rational cubes and half not. And I'll explain why later. So I think the expectation is one half, and we prove that it's strictly bigger than zero and strictly less than one. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah, good question. I see no further questions. Okay, great. Uh, so that's this is the statement we want to prove, uh, and the theorem is equivalent to the statement that if if you go across the family of cubic twists uh, of the Fermat curve, so in other words, if you look at the, the family x cubed plus y cubed equals n, right? Those are cubic twists of the Fermat of the Fermat elliptic curve. So x cubed plus y cubed equals n is a uh, x cubed plus y cubed equals n z cubed uh, is an elliptic curve, and and what we prove is that at least one sixth of them have rank zero and at least one twelfth of them have rank one. And that implies the statement that at least one sixth of integers uh, are not the sum of two rational cubes and at least one twelfth are. So, so the theorem is equivalent to this statement that in this family of elliptic curves, at least one sixth have rank zero and at least one twelfth have rank one. And, and actually, we consider something more general. We can consider general families of cubic twists of elliptic curves. Uh, any cubic twist family of elliptic curves can be expressed as a family of Mordell curves, uh, namely the family y squared equals x cubed plus d n squared, okay, where d is fixed and n varies. So if d is fixed and n varies, then this family e d n, y squared equals x cubed plus d n squared, that's a family of cubic twists. And all, uh, all families of cubic twists are of this, are of this form. So E D N, D is fixed and varies. Now that's a family of cubic twists of elliptic curves. And so for this family E D N, Y squared equals X cubed plus D N squared, uh, we prove a similar statement about lots of them having rank zero and lots of them having rank one. And since the elliptic curve X cubed plus Y cubed equals N, when you express it in wires just form, uh, it becomes y squared equals x cubed minus 432n squared. You can work that out. Uh, so in other words, uh, if we set d equals minus 432, then the family edn uh, is the family x cubed plus y cubed equals n. So y squared equals x cubed minus 432n squared is the same as the family x cubed plus y cubed equals n, just expressed in wires just form. Okay, so this family is more general than just the family of, of Fermat curves, uh, where we just set d equals minus 432. And so our more general theorem is that if you fix any d not equal to zero, then what you need for the curve to be non-degenerate. Uh, so if you fix d not equal to zero, then when n varies ordered by its absolute value, at least one sixth of the elliptic curves in any cubic twist family, e d n, where d is fixed and n varies, uh, at least one sixth of them have rank zero. And at least one sixth of the curves with good reduction at two actually have rank one. Yeah, so that's what we prove about a general cubic twist family. And if you let d equals minus 432, then that implies the statement about uh, the integers that are the sum of two cubes. That's because, it's because half of them have good reduction at two and half of them don't. Exactly, right. Problems. So when d is, right, right. And so when d is negative 432, exactly half have good reduction at two. And then we prove it that at least one sixth of those have uh, rank one, that's right. Okay, so that's the, that's the theorem uh, that we proved that implies the statement about uh, sum of two cubes as well.
Actually, maybe I can ask the question. Yeah. Sure. Um, if you fix more local conditions, do you again get positive density statements both ways? Yeah, so you can actually impose any sort of, well, as long as you don't impose the condition that all curves have bad reduction at two. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, so as long as you don't impose any such local condition where it contradicts the hypothesis, uh, yeah, any local conditions you can apply and the same theorem will hold. Yeah. But the density, will the density change or will it still be fixed? Density will actually stay the same, but you have to take into account how many have good reduction at two, that's all, for that, for that uh, rank one statement. Great, yeah, thanks. So maybe just a little bit of history. Uh, these, these curves, of course, have been studied a lot. The cubic twist families, uh, EDN, uh, have traditionally been studied actually via the Selmer groups associated to the isogeny. We'll call them square root of minus three. That takes EDN to E minus 27DN, defined over Q. So when you have a J invariant zero curve, there's a natural uh, degree three isogeny. Uh, from EDN to E minus 27 DN. And so you can study that Selmer group. And these curves have, have almost exclusively been, st been studied by that, by that Selmer group since that isogeny uh, exists for all these curves. Uh, and that, that allows one, by taking, the, you know, by taking the square root of minus three isogeny in one direction and then back, this allows one to determine the three Selmer group of any such curve in a fairly elementary manner. And in 1879, Sylvester used this square root of minus three descent, uh, as did Selmer in 1951, uh, to show that the three Selmer rank of x cubed plus y cubed equals p, where p is a prime, uh, that, that three Selmer rank is zero if p is two or five mod nine, and is one if p is four, seven, or eight mod nine. So for these particular congruence classes, the, the three Selmer rank ends up being either zero or one. Uh, when we're looking at the case where we're representing a prime as the sum of two rational cubes. And so what that means, uh, this proves immediately that primes that are two or five mod nine are not the sum of two cubes. And this computation of the three Selmer rank also led Sylvester naturally to conjecture that primes that are four, seven, or eight mod nine should be the sum of two cubes because if the three Selmer rank is one, then you expect that the rank to be, you expect the rank to be one. Uh, since you expect Sha to be a square and so on. Uh, and so this is called Sylvester's conjecture that primes that are four, seven, or eight mod nine are the sum of two rational cubes. And a proof of this Sylvester's conjecture was recently announced by, uh, by Daniel Kriz. Uh, so it's a very complicated proof and it's still being checked. So that's Sylvester's conjecture. Of course, this doesn't directly help in understanding the proportion of general numbers that are the sum of two rational cubes because primes are density zero. Uh, and in fact, the square root of minus three Selmer group or the three Selmer group is not very useful in studying x cubed plus y cubed equals n when n is not prime, especially when n starts to have many factors because the size of the square root of minus three Selmer group and therefore the three Selmer group tends to grow with the number of prime factors. And so the three Selmer group for general integers does not give much information. Uh, in fact, so just using this fact that the square root of minus three Selmer group tends to grow with the number of prime factors, you can easily use that to show that the average size of the three Selmer group of x cubed plus y cubed equals n as n varies uh, is infinity. Uh, so the average size of the three Selmer, I mean the three Selmer group just kind of blows up on average uh, for these curves. And so the three Selmer group is not going to be a useful way uh, to show that ranks are small, in particular that they're zero or one uh, in this family when n is not prime, when n is going across general integers, the three Selmer group is not very useful because it blows up uh, the number of prime factors of n and therefore it blows up on average. Okay. So that's why traditionally these curves have been studied using the three Selmer group because of the isogeny, but it only is very useful for, uh, for primes, primes being represented as the sum of two rational cubes. And that's what led to Sylvester's conjecture. But writing general integers of the sum of two cubes, this method is not, not so useful. And so what we do is we determine instead the average size of the two Selmer group rather than the three Selmer group. So we actually determine the average size of the two Selmer group of elliptic curves in any cubic twist family uh, by parameterizing 
and then determining the average size of the two Selmer group. And then we use this theorem on the average size of the two Selmer group to deduce that a positive proportion uh, of two Selmer rank zero curves exists in any cubic twist family. And so in particular, a positive portion of integers are not the sum of two rational cubes. And we also use it to show that a positive proportion of two Selmer rank one curves exist in any such cubic uh, twist family where they're curves that have good reduction at two. And then that can be shown uh, to have rank one. A lot of those curves can be shown to actually have rank one, not just two Selmer rank one. And that implies that a positive portion of integers are the sum of two rational cubes. And two key ingredients in this deduction, uh, going from two Selmer rank one to rank one, uh, involve, first of all, the p-parity theorem of Nekovar and Dachschitzer dachschitzer and also a p-converse theorem of, a recent p-converse theorem of Burungale and Skinner, which is kind of a two-adic version of the gross agier formula. To produce, a, to produce a rational point on the elliptic curve. So I'll explain this a little bit more in a little bit. I just wanted to give you a quick overview. So the, so the steps of the proof are as, are as follows. So to prove that a positive portion of integers are respectively are not the sum of two rational cubes, first, uh, we develop a parameterization of two Selmer elements of elliptic curves in a cubic twist family uh, by certain integer points on on a G-invariant quadric hypersurface in the space of triply symmetric two by two by two by two matrices. Okay, so two by two by two by two matrices are just these uh, four-dimensional two by two by two by two matrices. Uh, uh, with entries in your base field, or we're gonna eventually take the entries to be in Z. And SL2 cross SL2 cross SL2 cross SL2 naturally acts on those, but if you, if you decide that you want, there's a natural action of S3 on these last three coordinates, right, of your two by two by two by two by two matrix. And if you ask for just those matrices that are invariant under that action of S3, we call those triply symmetric hypercubes, hypercubical matrices. And then naturally SL2 cross SL2 acts on those, right? SL2 acts on this first uh, two, right? And then the other SL2 acts on, on the other two, because there's only one, because this has been triply symmetrized. So a triply symmetrized two by two by two, two by two by two matrix, you can think of also as a binary cubic form. And so the space is kind of the space of pairs of binary cubic forms on which SL2 cross SL2 naturally acts, right? Uh, as first SL2 acts on the pair of binary cubics, and then this other SL2 acts simultaneously on both binary cubics. Okay, so this is the space of pairs of binary cubic forms on which SL2 cross SL2 acts. And it turns out this space, this action, of SL2 cross SL2 on this pair of binary cubic forms has a degree two invariant, which if we set equal to zero, will be therefore a G invariant quadric hypersurface. And the claim is that two Selmer elements of elliptic curves in a cubic twist family can be parameterized by integer points on this quadric hypersurface where that degree two invariant has been set equal to zero uh, for the action of SL2 cross SL2 on pairs of binary cubics. And I'll explain how this parameterization uh, works. In a second. Uh, anyway, the, the point is that we have a parameterization of two Selmer elements of elliptic curves in, uh, in a any given cubic twist family. And since we're counting points on a quadric hypersurface, uh, uh, so to count two Selmer elements, we're going to count the integer points on this quadric hypersurface because those integer points are parameterizing the two Selmer elements. And we'll, to count these uh, integer points on that quadric hypersurface, we use geometry of numbers. Uh, together with uh, the circle method, because we're trying to count on a, on a variety, namely this quadric hypersurface. So we combine geometry of numbers methods with the, with the circle method of Ramanuj and Hardy, Littlewood, Klosterman, Heath Brown, uh, basically use it in the form that Heath Brown now describes it, uh, to count integer points on this quadric in a fundamental domain for the action of SL2 cross SL2. Because these integer points, the two Selmer elements are going to correspond to SL2 cross SL2 orbits. Of integer points, so we just count points in a fundamental domain uh, with bounded invariance using the circle method and geometry of numbers. And once we've done that count, that therefore gives us, a, with this, after a suitable sieve, it gives us a determination of the average size of it. We have to impose local solubility conditions, right? So that's a sieve. Uh, there's a congruence condition for every place. So using a sieve, we actually then determine the average size of the two Selmer group 
of EDN for any family EDN where D is fixed and N varies. For, so for any cubic twist family, we determine the average size of the two summer group. Uh, and then we do an analysis of root numbers in the family EDN where D is fixed and N varies. And we prove that these root numbers are equidistributed in any cubic twist family. And once that's in place, then we apply the P parity theorem, which says that the root number should agree with the parity of the two Selmer group. So that allows us to deduce that many curves have rank zero, two Selmer rank zero and two Selmer rank one. The two Selmer rank zero will immediately apply rank zero. The two Selmer rank one curves, we need a two converse theorem, a Gross-Zagier type formula, uh, that's two attic, to show that many of the curves also have rank one. So that's, uh, that's sort of the outline of the proof, and I'll sort of say a little bit more about each step uh, in the coming, uh, coming slides. Quick question, is it just in the last step where the bad reduction of two comes into play? That's right, that's exactly right. So this, at, at the current time, the two converse theorems of Berlin and Skinner, they, uh, they make the assumption that you have good reduction at two. So that eventually those kinds of things uh, should be removed, but right now those technical assumptions were needed to prove those, uh, that those gross agave type formulas hold too adequately. Uh, they only are able to prove it right now when there's good reduction at two. Yeah, exactly. Eventually, eventually they should be able to, they think like they should be able to handle uh, all, all cases, but it just gets more technical. Yeah, any other questions on the, on the basic uh, strategy? Uh, yes, one more. Did you say there's one more question? So there's this off average surface, which is where you're equal to at least two variance and zero. Do points on the level set or is some other value that could be the position two? Yeah, Kevin, can you repeat that? Uh, actually, that we discussed it. So the you have this three two invariance, and the quadratic hypersurface is defined by this to be equal to zero. What happens if you ask like is the quadratic the two three two invariance three? Or is that an interesting arithmetic set as well? Yeah, we could probably do that, and in a couple of slides, uh, we'll see what that means, and we can decide if it's interesting. Nice. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I'm not sure if it's interesting, but maybe. Yeah, I mean, I think it would be. Uh, yeah, we can, uh, I'll show you the family in a second. Yeah. Okay, great. So, okay, so first I'll talk about this parameterization and you can see what, the, what that degree two invariant is and what it means. Sorry, was there another question? No, go ahead. Okay. Uh, okay, so, uh, so I'll just say a little bit about two by two by two by two matrices and their relation with elliptic curves. This is joint work with Weho uh, that we use. So let, you know, let K be a field with characteristic K not equal to two. And let A uh, in, in K2 tensor K2 tensor K2 tensor K2 uh, be a two by two by two by two matrix with entries in K. So A will be a two by two by two by two matrix with entries in K. Then we can view A as a quadrilinear form on say W1 cross W2 cross W3 cross W4 where the WI are two dimensional vector spaces over K, right? So such a four dimensional matrix can be viewed as a quadrilinear form on the product of four two dimensional vector spaces, WI. And now we can consider this set, uh, we'll call it C12 of K, consider this set uh, of W1 comma W2, uh, little W1 comma little W2 and big W1 cross W2 such that if you plug in w1 comma w2 into this quadrilinear form so if you plug in w1 comma w2 into a quadrilinear form you end up with a bilinear form right on w3 cross w4 and so you can ask if the determinant of that two by two matrix is zero and so we'll look at all pairs w1 comma w2 right in the product of the first two vector spaces such that when you plug them in the determinant is zero. You get a you get a degenerate matrix. Okay, so that's that's a set, uh, and it's clearly 
it doesn't matter if you scale W1 or W2 for this condition. So it's actually in P of W1 cross P of W2. So these are like two P1s. So we're considering a set in P1 cross P1, such that if you plug in uh, those points in P1 cross P1 into the quadrilinear form, you get, uh, you get a bilinear form with determinant zero. You get a two by two matrix with determinant zero. So that's a set inside P1 cross P1. Uh, yeah, feel free to interrupt if anything was unclear about this definition. Uh, so that's a set in P1 cross P1, just the things that when you plug into the first two coordinates, you get a degenerate matrix, two by two matrix. Then, then C1, 2K consists of the set of K points of a by degree 2, 2 curve in P1 cross P1, right? Because the determinant is a degree two function on this two by two matrix, it's degree two in each direction in, in both W3 and W4. And so it's a 2, 2 curve in, uh, in these two coordinates. Right? So C1, 2, K consists of the set of K points of a by, sorry, it's a, it's, a, it's a curve in P of W1 cross P of W2 defined by uh, a 2, 2 form. And so it's generically a smooth genus one curve. And there's a notion of a discriminant of, of this two by two by two by two matrix. Let's assume that discriminant is non-zero. Then you get a generically, in that case, you get a smooth genus one curve. So, so this is a way of taking a, a two by two by two by two matrix and producing a genus one curve in P1 cross P1. The and the way you make it is just, you look at all points in W1 cross W2, such so that if you plug it into the, this quadrilinear form, uh, you get a degenerate two by two matrix. Mm -hmm. So in this way, we obtain six genus one curves, Cij in P1 cross P1, because here we just did it for the first and second coordinates, but we could have done it for the first and third and the first and fourth. Whatever. So, and this way we obtain six genus one curves, Cij in P1 cross P1. Okay, so I hope that construction is clear. Okay, we're just looking, we're just looking at pairs of coordinates that we can plug into the quadrilinear form to get uh, a degenerate bilinear form. Okay, and that defines a genus one curve in, in the corresponding P1 cross P1. And there's something more. Uh, if you look at this, so I'll just write the definition of the curve again. C1, 2 of K, this is a curve, genus one curve in P1 cross P1. In fact, this curve C1, 2 actually is, while it's defined as being in P of W1 cross P of W2, it actually naturally lies in P of W1 cross P of W2 cross P of W3 in P1 cross P1 cross P1. And the reason is, if you have a W1 comma W2 in C1, 2, since, sorry, H is the same thing as A, sorry about that. So if you plug in W1 comma W2 into that quadrilinear form, because the resulting bilinear form is singular, it has a kernel in this coordinate or in this coordinate. And so if you just take the kernel and call that W3, that's going to be generically one dimensional kernel. So is it just a natural kernel inside P of W3? And so we obtain a well-defined element W3, namely the kernel of that bilinear form, such so that the quadrilinear form evaluated w1 comma w2 comma w3 is just identically zero. And so c12 is naturally isomorphic to this curve c123, which is a set of all triples w1 comma w2 comma w3 in this p1 cross p1 cross p1, such so that if you plug in those values w1, w2, w3, you just get identically zero. And so this also gives the set of k points of a genus one curve, and it's isomorphic to c12. The isomorphism just being, you take the set of all W1, W2, and then you take the kernel in the third direction and you just tack that on. And you get W1, W2, W3 on C123. And clearly the projection of C123 onto P, onto P of W1 cross P of W2 gives an isomorphism onto C12. And so C123 provides us with explicit isomorphisms among the three curves C12, C13, and C23, because you can project from C123 to any of these three curves just by forgetting that the relevant coordinate, just by projection onto the relevant P1 cross P1. So C123 is a curve in P1 cross P1 cross P1, and by projecting onto any of the pairs of P1s, you get back C12, C13, and C23. So therefore, these that allows us to show that all these three curves are isomorphic. C12, C13, and C23. So via projection and unprojection, right? So you go from C123, project onto C12, 
Uh, from C12, you can unproject onto C123 and then project onto C13, and so that shows that these two are isomorphic, and so on. So C123 kind of encapsulates the data of C12, C13, and C23 all at once inside a single P1 cross P1 cross P1. Here. I know I'm saying a lot, uh, but the constructions are, are quite elementary. Just linear algebra. Uh, okay, so, so I'll just write down here the definition of C123. It's just the set of triples in W1 cross W2 cross W3 up to scaling, such that when you plug them into the quadrilinear form, you get identically zero. And that's a genus one curve in P1 cross P1 cross P1. And so we similarly have curves C124 and C134 and C234 in P1 cross P1 cross P1. And these curves are also all isomorphic to C123. And why is that? Well, because you can take C123, you can project onto C12, that's an isomorphism, and then you can unproject onto C124. And so that gives you an isomorphism from C123 to C124. So all these genus one curves that you can construct in this way by by saying, let's just take three coordinates and put them in and see if we get identically zero uh, in the appropriate P1 cross P1 cross P1. These are all isomorphic. Uh, and the natural maps are given by projection and unprojection. So project onto C12 here and then unproject onto C124, and that gives you the isomorphism between these two curves. And so you get this tetrahedron of maps between uh, these four genus one curves and the four different possible P1 cross P1 cross P1s. So these four curves are all naturally isomorphic by a projection and unprojection. But there's a twist in the story, which is that this tetrahedron of maps uh, do not commute. <laughs> so you can go from C123 to C124, and then you can go to C234, and then go back to C123 by projection and unprojection, right? So C123 can project onto C12, and then unproject onto C124, and then project onto C24, and then unproject onto C234 and then you know, do the same thing and come back. And it's not the identity map on C123. So these isomorphisms do not commute with each other, and so there's some um, additional data beyond this genus one curves that's being generated. And what is that data? So for example, if you go around this triangle here, turns out you get an involution on C123. And therefore, if you go around this triangle and then do go around this triangle, that's the same thing as going around this quadrilateral. And so going around that quadrilateral is the product of two involutions, and therefore it's actually a translation of the curve by a point on the Jacobian of that genus one curve. So, so if one starts at C1, one, two, three, and goes around a triangle, one gets an involution, you can show. And then it, therefore, if one starts at C1, two, three, and follows a quadrilateral of isomorphisms, then because it's a product of two involutions, uh, it turns out that that has to be then, therefore, a translation of C123 by a point, let's call it Pij, on the Jacobian of C123. And I'm calling it Pij because there are sort of three different quadrilaterals that you could take around, uh, starting at C123. And so you get, uh, you have a P12, a P13, and a P23. So you get three points on the Jacobian just by and you end up translating by that, by just by going around the three different possible quadrilaterals here. And so, okay, I won't get into the details of these three points other than saying you can show that the sum of these three points, just because these three points are defined by products of two involutions, you can just see that if you take the product of these involutions, well, they all cancel and you get the identity and therefore the, the sum of these three points is zero on the Jacobian. So these three points that you end up translating by, uh, uh, they sum to zero on the Jacobian. Uh, there are other ways to see these points. Uh, they're the difference of the two degree two divisors on the two projections onto. So if P12 is just the difference of D1 and D2, where D1 and D2 correspond to the divisors of the projections onto P of W1 and P of W2. That's another way to see it. Uh, but anyway, the point is, that if you go around the three quadrilaterals, you get three, you translate by three different points on the Jacobian, you translate the curve by three different points, and those three points sum to zero. And so, so the theorem that uh, Wei and I proved is that there's a canonical bijection between 
uh, GL2 to the fourth orbits on the space of two by two by two by two matrices over K. And isomorphism classes of triples, C, comma L, comma P, P prime, P double prime. Okay, where C is a genus one curve over K. L is a degree two line bundle on C. The degree two line bundle is what's giving, uh, say, the, say the map from C to the first P1, P of W1. And P, P prime, P double prime are, are three non-zero K points uh, on the Jacobian of C. So that's the data. So uh, two by two by two by two, two by two by two by two matrices over K. Uh, their orbits under that natural action of GL2 uh, K to the fourth. They naturally correspond to the data of a genus one curve, a degree two line bundle, and three points on the Jacobian of C that's sum to zero. Uh, and that's the theorem. And I showed you one direction of how to, how to start with a two by two by two by two matrix and get this data. Uh, and there's a corresponding reverse construction that you can show is the, is the inverse. Yeah. Okay, so that's the, that's the theorem. So just to clarify, because you're not shuffling the factors around, this triple at the end is four, right? Uh, this triple at the end is the triple at the, the p p prime p double prime. That's an order. The order is is That's an order that. right. That ordering would go away if we also say like introduce an action of S four on this, yeah, or something, yeah, or S three even, yeah. That's right. It's ordered. Yeah. That's right. Thanks. Uh, okay. So. So another way to say it. Uh, so. Now let's now let's look, now let's actually look at that action of S three that you just brought up. Uh, so say we we look at those uh, two by two by two matrices that are stable under the action of S three that permutes these three factors. Okay, so then it'll be like pairs of binary cubics in that case. And so if we just restrict to that subset and GL two squared naturally acts on that, then because we've imposed this condition that uh, it's S three invariant, then this also has to become S three invariant. Uh, because you can show that the action of this S3 results in an action of S3 here in the natural way. Uh, and so if this is invariant under S3, then these three points all have to become the same, uh, but they sum to zero, and therefore P becomes a three torsion point. So if you look at K2 tensor sim3 K2 with the action of GL2 squared, that parameterizes the data of a genus one curve, a degree two line bundle, and an order three point on the Jacobian, a rational, K rational order three point. And so that's, that's a corresponding theorem that we proved just by that triple symmetrization that there is a canonical bijection between non-degenerate GL2 squared orbits on, on the space of pairs of binary cubic forms over K and isomorphism classes of triples CLP where C is a genus, a smooth genus one curve, L is a degree two line bundle and P is a non-zero three torsion point on the Jacobian of C that's defined over K. Okay, so I hope that, uh, hope that deduction makes sense, at least philosophically. Of course, you have to prove this, but this is uh, what it ends up being. Uh, so that's the, that's the theorem that we're actually gonna use. So GL2 squared orbits on pairs of binary cubics over K, parameterized uh, genus one curve, degree two line bundle, and an order three point on the Jacobian. And the action of GL2 squared, or say SL2 squared on pairs of binary cubics Turns out there are two polynomial invariants for this action, uh, and they have degrees two and six, uh, which we call A1 and A3 respectively. And the reason we call them A1 and A3 is that if you look at the Jacobian uh, of the curve C that arises from a pair of binary cubics with invariants A1 and A3, uh, that Jacobian has, uh, has equation y squared plus A1xy plus A3y equals x cubed, which is the universal family of elliptic curves having a three torsion point, namely at zero, zero. And so there, so there's their three torsion point on the Jacobian, it's just zero, zero. So that's kind of, that's kind of beautiful that the equation of the, of the elliptic curve that has a three torsion point has, has two invariants, A1 and A3, and those correspond to the invariants A1 and A3 uh, of this action. 
And yeah, so those just line up. So the Jacobian of C has exactly this equation where A1 and A3 are its A1 and A3 invariants. Uh, and there's another beautiful way of looking at all this uh, from the perspective of Lee theory uh, in the PhD thesis work of Jack Thorne. And if you haven't seen that, that's also very, uh, another way of interpreting all this. Okay, so any, any questions on the invariant theory here? So this action has these two invariants, degree two, degree six. And the Jacobian of the curve C that corresponds to this pair of minor cubics using the constructions we just described is given by by this equation where A1 and A3 are the invariants of this action of SL2 squared, K2 tensors and 3K2. Okay, so that's the, that's the parameterization. And now we can take it one step further. We can ask, well, what happens if we set A1 equals zero? And again, we can also ask what happens if A1 equals three, and that's another family. Uh, but A1 equals zero is a very special family, but you may be interested in setting A1 to other things, and we could do that in principle if, um, if you were interested. Okay, but what happens if you set a1 equals zero? Well, then we're just going to be looking at orbits here where the a1, the degree two invariant is zero, and here we're going to be looking at the elliptic curves y squared plus a3y equals x cubed. And if you complete the square, that just looks like y squared equals x cubed plus a constant times the square. So one thing I should just say uh, here. Uh, we haven't described any Selmer elements, but if you impose the condition that this curve is locally soluble everywhere, at every place, then you can restrict to that. So you can restrict to those curves that are locally soluble, so those orbits where you get something locally soluble. And in that case, you get a parameterization of two Selmer elements. So a 2 by 2 by 2 by 2 integer matrix is called locally soluble if the corresponding genus 1 curve has points everywhere locally. And so you get a, a car. Uh, corresponding corollary that the elements in the two Selmer group of the elliptic curve E, y squared plus a1xy plus a3y equals x cubed is the universal family with a rational free torsion point at zero, zero, are in bijection with SL2q equivalence classes on the set of locally soluble elements of the space Z2 tensor sim 3 Z3 of pairs of integral binary cubic forms having invariance equal to, so this is uh, we're proving something about the integers now, integer orbits. So the theorem that we prove is that we just restrict them to locally soluble elements, and then we, we therefore get a parameterization of the two Selmer elements of E, where E is of this form. So the two Selmer group S2 of E, where E is of this form, with the invariance A1 and A3, are in bijection with equivalence classes on the set of locally soluble elements of the space of pairs of integer uh, binary cubic form, pairs of integer cu binary cubic forms, whose invariance match uh, the A1 corresponds to the A1 invariant on the representation, and the A3 corresponds to the A3 invariant. It may be, there may be a fudge factor, that you, a fixed fudge factor that you have to introduce that involves twos and threes. Uh, but this is, the, this is exactly the same theorem that was on the previous slide, except we're actually showing that they're integer orbits uh, that represent, they're actually integer points that represent uh, classes that are locally soluble. So if we, had, if we had put Q2 tensor sim 3 Q2 here, we knew that from the previous page, but the claim is that you can always find integer points. Uh, and this is analogous to the work of uh, Birch and Swinerton Dyer when they found integer binary quartics corresponding to two Selmer elements with the right invariants, uh, and the corresponding work of Cremona and Fisher and Stoll for, for other representations where they show that you can minimize uh, and therefore find integer orbits. So this is analogous to that kind of theorem, that you always have integer orbits uh, doing what you want when you're restricting to locally soluble elements and Selmer elements. And so a corollary is that the elements in the two Selmer group, uh, S2e of this family, y squared equals x cubed plus 16n squared. And how did I get this family? I just set a1 equal to zero and then completed the square, right? So then when you complete the square, uh, you get an a3 over 2 squared coming out and that becomes a 16a3 squared. So I'm just calling that n squared. And so if you restrict to a1 equals zero, you get the corollary that the elements in the two Selmer group S2 of E of the family Y squared equals X cubed plus 16 N squared are in bijection with SL2Q squared equivalence classes on the set of locally soluble pairs of integral binary cubic forms having vanishing A1 invariant, right? We want this to vanish. And A3 agreeing with N uh, up, to a, up to a fixed integer. The A3 invariant agreeing with N. So the, the fudge in the first theorem, the, 
the, the are you saying the fudge factor is something you read off from a one a three by doing Tate's algorithm at two and three on the spur? That's right. Yeah, and I think something like fifty four it ends up being. Okay, and so in the corollary, there is a specific integer m. Um, yeah, which I think you can take to be fifty four. Okay. But, yeah, but anyway, some fixed. Yeah, some fixed integer involving twos and threes. Yeah. Okay, so here's a parameter. So that's why a1 equals zero was interesting, but this is uh, just to the previous question. If you want to set a1 equal to be something else, then that would be some other family. Uh, but a1 equals zero, you can see is a special family, namely one that has j invariant zero, y squared equals x cubed plus 16 n squared. And so we've ended up parameterizing the two Selmer group of a family of elliptic curves, cubic twists of elliptic curves with j invariant zero, which is what we had set out to do. And so there's our parameterization of two Selmer elements. They're parameterized by pairs of integral binary cubic forms where the quadratic invariant vanishes. So that's what two Selmer elements of, of this cubic twist family of elliptic curves is parameterized by. And let's see if I can, uh, so I just want to note it, I just want to observe that you can get to any other cubic twist family uh, here. <laughs> by just quadratic twisting this family. So if you take a cubic twist family and you quadratic twist it by a fixed integer, uh, you end up getting another cubic twist family. So all cubic twist families are related to each other by, a, by taking a quadratic twist. And when you take a quadratic twist of an elliptic curve, uh, the H1, right, that the two Selmer group sits in, right, the cohomology group that it sits in, is the same because the two torsion uh, subgroups of a quadratic, right, of two quadratic twist family, uh, two quadratic twists, right, are the same. So they sit in the same cohomology group. And so once we have this parameterization of, of some cubic twist family, the two Selmer groups of some cubic twist family, we're actually able to uh, tweak that to get a parameterization of the two Selmer group of any cubic twist family just by taking a quadratic twist and noticing that when you quadratic twist, you're lying in the same cohomology group. Uh, the two Selmer groups lying in the same cohomology group. And so this is the theorem. I mean, it's, it's a non-trivial modification, but it's one that you can imagine you can do because, uh, because the H1 that the two Selmer group lies and stays the same when you do a quadratic twist. And so this is a, a theorem with Levent and, and Ari that the elements in the two Selmer group of any given cubic twist family, right? So the set of two Selmer elements across all the elliptic curves in any given cubic twist family are in bijection with equivalence classes of integral pairs of binary cubic forms, satisfying certain congruence conditions that depend on, on D uh, at primes dividing D Having vanishing a1 invariant, because we want, uh, right, we were restrict, right, we're setting a1 equal to zero there. Uh, and a3 is again some fudge factor, which is different than before, it depends on d, uh, such that uh, the invariant d agrees with the a3 invariant of the pair of binary cubics. So now this m is not something fixed, but, it's, but it is fixed once you fix d, and it depends on d. So this is a parameterization now of two Selmer groups across any cubic twist family. And so in order to determine the average size of the two Selmer group now across any cubic twist family, we have to count a certain weighted number of integer points, satisfying certain congruence conditions, lying on a quadric a1 equals zero, in a fundamental domain for the action of SL2z squared, on the eight-dimensional space of real pairs of binary cubic forms. Okay, so I hope this sentence now kind of makes sense based on, on the parameterization that we've worked out. So to count all the two Selmer group elements across all curves in this family where n is bounded, uh, we have to count the number of integer points on this quadric hypersurface, right, in this eight-dimensional space with bounded A3 invariant in a fundamental domain for the action of SL2z squared acting on this quadric hypersurface in this eight-dimensional space. And we have to count the number of integer points on this quadric hypersurface in this certain, in this unbounded region defined by A3 uh, less than uh, some bound. And then you let that bound go to infinity and you'll get asymptotics for the number of two Selmer elements. So to do that, we use geometry of numbers techniques to count these integer points uh, in this unbounded but finite volume region. So it's unbounded because this fundamental domain is unbounded, because the fundamental domain for SL2R mod SL2Z is unbounded. Uh, so this is an unbounded region on this quadric hypersurface, uh, but it's finite volume once you say that A3 is bounded. Uh, 
Uh, and to, to count the number of integer points on that surface, uh, that's where we use the circle, your circle or delta method of uh, Klosterman and Heathbrown. And this combination of techniques, uh, combining geometry of numbers with the circle method, uh, was first studied by Sam Ruth in his uh, PhD thesis uh, in the case of binary quartic forms, and then written in a very generally applicable form for very general quadrics by uh, Levent uh, Alpoje in his thesis. And so those are the, those are the kinds of methods uh, we use on this rather more complicated region, yeah? but uh, we can still apply it. So we use geometry of numbers together with the circle method as in Levent's thesis. In the main body of the fundamental domain, we apply the circle slash delta method, because when you have a nice round region, that's where the circle delta method uh, is traditionally applied. Uh, and we use it to give count the number of integral points on this quadric in an approximate cube uh, inside R8. And then, then we have the cusps of this unbounded region, and we have to handle those. It turns out for some of the cusps, we can just apply a simple divisor bound to get something that's good enough. And then deep in the cusp, where the, that's where the work is, uh, we have to show that uh, that the integral points there are, are very rare, uh, except for a certain uh, sub-variety that sits in that cusp where all the integer points happen to correspond to identity elements of the Selmer group. And so we don't have to count those. We can count, identity elements are easy to count uh, separately. So uh, we show that deep in the cusp, most of the integral points just correspond to uh, identity elements. And so we don't have to count those. And so that's how we end up getting the asymptotics for the number of integer points in an unbounded region on a quadric inside R8. And, and in this process, actually, we discover some, some, some new formulas for the singular integral and the singular series that appear in the circle method in terms of real and piadic integrals uh, with respect to Haar measure on SL2 cross SL2. Uh, so it, it gives some very natural formulas for for the singular integral and singular series, which we actually use uh, to obtain good estimates on the number of integer points. So we actually get an asymptotic on the number of integer points as the bound on A3 goes to infinity. And using these formulas for the singular integral and singular series, uh, we can compute the local densities. And we find these local densities at each prime. They agree with those arising in previous work on the average size of the two Selmer group of the universal family of elliptic curves. Uh, as studied with uh, Earl and, and Wei in, in previous spaces when we were just counting uh, in an entire affine space, not on a, on a variety. But it turns out the densities turn out to be the same on the variety as well. And so even in this thin set of elliptic curves, we're able to prove that if you fix D not equal to zero, uh, when N varies ordered by its absolute value, the average size of the two Selmer group of EDN where D is fixed and N varies, so there's a cubic twist family, the average size of the two Selmer group in any cubic twist family is three, which was the same average for the two Selmer group across all the universal family of elliptic curves. So even when we restrict to this thin family where we're just going across cubic twists of J invariant zero, average is still three. And, and we show that the same average of three holds even when N satisfies any finite set or even suitable infinite sets of congruence conditions. So this three is very, very stable. It's true for all elliptic curves, it's true for these thin families, it's true for these thin families of cubic twists where we even impose any congruence conditions. So this three is very, very stable under restricting to subfamilies and imposing congruence conditions. And, and then that's basically what allows us to, to prove the main theorems. Uh, so I'll just describe that. So ordering by absolute value of n. Uh, so this is, this is the root number analysis that I talked about. Uh, so in any family of cubic twists, what we prove is that if you order by n, half the curves, I'll just state it for this family for now, half the curve x cubed plus y cubed equals n have root number plus one and half have root number minus one. So the way we prove this is we show that uh, we can extract the root number plus one by, by, by congruence conditions on n. Uh, there are infinitely many involved, but uh, so I won't give the details here, but basically the point is that we can identify congruence conditions uh, to specify the root number. And then when, since it's defined by certain suitable congruence conditions where the selberg delange method applies, we just apply the selberg delange method on the root number in this family as n goes to infinity, and we can show equidistribution of this root number uh, as n varies. 
And so when we order by n, half the curves in this family have root number plus one, and half have root number minus one. And that's basically by identifying appropriate congruence conditions and then applying the selbert delange estimation method. Okay, so the root number is equidistributed. Uh, and that, in conjunction with the fact that the average size of the two Selmer group is three, allows us to really make a number of conclusions. So since we can extract all root number plus one curves by congruence conditions, what that implies is that the average size of the two Selmer group in a family of cubic twists is three, even if one restricts to just those n where the root number is plus one. So if you just restrict, you just go to, a, go to any cubic twist family and you restrict to just those root number plus one curves, the average size of the two Selmer group is three, even when you fix the root number. And that's, uh, so that's kind of neat. Uh, and that's actually something Poonin and Rain's heuristics predict, that if you go across all root number plus one curves and all root number minus one curves, the two Selmer group uh, average should be three, even when you fix the root number. And that we're able to prove that conjecture of theirs in, this, in any cubic twist spin. And now that we know that the root number is equidistributed uh, and the average size of the two Selmer group doesn't change when you fix the root number, we can now apply the p-parity theorem of Nekovar and Dachschitzer, Dachschitzer, which says that the two summer rank must be consistent with the root number. And so therefore across, uh, torsion is rare in these, in these curves, so across the root number plus one curves, we know that the two Selmer group size has to be an even power of two by the p-parity theorem. So the, average, so the two Selmer group size will, across the root number plus one curves in any cubic twist family, the two Selmer group size will always be an even power of two, that is one, four, 16, and so on. Uh, but the average size is three. And what that means, if the average size is three and it's uh, numbers that whose average is three consists of one, four, 16, and so on, that means there have to be a bunch of ones in that, right? because if you're gonna average to three, you're gonna need a lot of ones. You can't all be four onwards and have an average size of three. So a positive portion of curves will have two Selmer group size one. In other words, two Selmer rank zero. Uh, similarly, for root, minus, root number minus one curves, the two Selmer group size will always be an odd power of two, two, eight, 32, and so on. And again, the average size is three, uh, as this theorem says, and so there'll have to be lots of them that have size two. They can't be all eight and odd ones. So most curves will have to have two Selmer group size two among the root number minus one curves, and therefore lots of them have two Selmer rank one. So that's that conclusion. So since the average size is three across all of those EDN by the p-parity theorem, uh, at least one third of these curves must have two Selmer rank zero. I just described the reasoning for that. And, and so if you fix D not equal to zero as N varies ordered by absolute value, at least one sixth of the elliptic curves EDN have to have two Selmer rank zero and thus rank zero, right? So this was concluded by noting that the average size of two Selmer group is three and uh, noting that the root number plus one curves all have to have even powers of two as their two Selmer group sizes, and so lots of them have to have two Selmer group size one, and therefore two Selmer rank zero, and thus rank zero. So that's how we prove that lots of curves have rank zero in any cubic twist family. And similarly, uh, for root number minus one, I already explained how most curves therefore have to have, if the average size across root number minus one curves have two Selmer group size three on average, uh, and they always have to be odd powers of two, then they have to be two to the one in size most of the time. Uh, and so at least five, six of these curves with root number minus one must have two Selmer rank one. And so since half of them have root number minus one, we get at least five twelfths of the elliptic curves EDN have two Selmer rank one. And, and now we apply the P-converse theorem of Burungula and Skinner, which allows us to conclude that a curve has rank one if it has P-Selmer rank one under certain technical assumptions, which in the case of two include the condition that the curve should have good reduction at two. And so corollary uh, using the, the p-converse theorem of Burungula and Skinner is that as n varies ordered by absolute value, at least one-sixth of the elliptic curves EDN with good reduction at two have rank one. So the reason why uh, it's reduced from five-twelfths to one-sixth is that uh, it's just that these technical assumptions of Burungula and Skinner have to be applied. Uh, and that reduces the proportion, but at least it's a positive proportion that satisfy those technical assumptions, one of which is good reduction at two. And so, yeah, so that's the final consequence. So therefore, by, when ordered by absolute value, 
A positive portion of integers are the sum of two rational cubes, right? Because a positive portion of the corresponding family of elliptic curves has to have rank one. And similarly, a positive portion are not the sum of two rational cubes. Uh, because a positive portion of the corresponding family of elliptic curves have rank zero. So in fact, they have two sum of rank zero. Uh, so that's the yeah, so that's the that's the proof of the of the main result that I want to note. I just want to note one last thing is that there are lot there are lots of other families that uh, uh, that arise as families of cubic twists. So here's another kind of consequence. When ordered by absolute value, a positive portion of integers are the product of three rational numbers in arithmetic progression, and a positive portion are not, uh, because the corresponding elliptic curve there is also a cubic twist family. So any kind of, a lot of these arithmetic kinds of problems end up being cubic twist families of elliptic curves. And so one can use these results to, to say the corresponding positive proportion statements about integers with, with those kinds of properties as well. Okay, so I think I'll uh, et cetera. And, uh, we'll stop there. Yeah. Thanks so much. Thank you. Um, all right, let's go uh, to the question. Yeah, happy to take questions. Can you hear me? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Thanks. Uh, what happened to your point order three? Your construction, you went from a hypercube to a curve in one with point order three of this curve, and then never heard about it. Okay. Okay. Then can you repeat the question? I couldn't hear it so well. Right. The question was what happened to your point of order three, your parameterization? Oh, so that's uh, that's the special case where d is 16. Uh, but then we quadratic twisted it away. Uh, we went to a quadratic twist family of that family. Uh, we were able to still compute the two Selmer group, uh, we parameterize the two Selmer group in the quadratic twist family because the H1s are the same. But when you took that quadratic twist, the, the, the three torsion point disappeared. Uh, it was just that three torsion point ended up being defined over that quadratic extension that we twisted by. Uh, another question. Um, can you say something about the proportion that are the sum of rational cubes but are not the sum of integer cubes? Yeah, it's easy to see that 0% of integers are the sum of two integer cubes. It's just very rare. And so, yeah, the, yeah so that's just a zero density set anyway. The numbers that are the sum of two integer cubes is just a very, very rare set. Because the cubes get far apart very quickly, and so the ones, the guys that can be written as the sum of two integer cubes are just uh, very rare densities here. Question. Oh, um, so I think um, I last time when I saw this in my talk from Germany or somewhere else, I think the proportion in which um, an integer is expressible as a sum of two cubes was um, number 21 from what I remember. So um, I think what you present today is that one over, there, there is at least one of the wrong instruments which can be expressed in some of the international cubes. So um, are you counting more of the curves that has bad reduction and you're thinking that those of the curves that so can be proven to have rank one? Or, um, is the if I understood the question right, uh, yeah, yeah, in the paper we actually write two over 21 instead of one twelfth. Yes. And uh, 2 over 21 is a better result. <laughs> uh, I just said 1 12th here for simplicity, and it's an easy argument to get 1 12th. We have a couple of tricks to make it a little bit bigger to 2 over 21, but it's not so much bigger that I wanted to get into it in a talk. <laughs> so that's the only reason. Yeah, uh, we can do a little bit better than, than the constants I wrote here with some tricks. Thank you. Yeah, yeah I could ask a follow-up. If you, if you were, is the next better to get those constants up to try to somehow find a parameterization of three Selmer and cubic twist? Yeah, if one could do higher Selmer, one would get better results. Uh, the other thing that I would get a lot, just as far as the proportions are concerned, if, if Burungale and Skinner are able to remove all technical assumptions, which they think they will be able to at some point, we actually get five twelfths of all integers being the sum of two rational cubes, which is very close to the expected one half. So even without going to any other Selmer, um, we'd get to 
we'd get five twelfths of all integers are the sum of two rational cubes if uh, Burungal and Skinner uh, were able to remove all their technical assumptions and their theatic gross the, Yeah, but the other way to really get a half, a half, uh, if one, one, yeah, if one could determine all Selmer groups, then one, uh, then one should presumably and and have good piatic gross zaggy at every p, then uh, one would get the result of half and half for the number of in, for the proportion of integers that are the sum of two rational cubes. So maybe I won't win. Uh, if there are no further questions, let's thank Mondo once more. Thanks so much. <laughs>